You'll know this guy from his many, many works, especially The Knife of, letting, of Never Letting Go, that trilogy. And by the way, the movie adaptation of Chaos Walking, which is going to be coming to video on demand. It's in theaters now as well. Such a pleasure to talk to this guy. It's Patrick Ness. Patrick, how are you doing? I'm all right. It's a sunny, sunny morning in Los Angeles. So, you know, I'll take it. It's a good start. Hard to argue with that. Now, Chaos Walking was the, the film adaptation was first announced in 2011. So obviously this was a long, long process for you. So what was it like to see this adaptation finally come to the screen this year? <laughs> uh, the end of a long wait. Yeah. I mean, there's, it takes what it takes sometimes, you sure, know, yeah. I, mean, uh, I, I, in the, in the interim, I had a, I had a shorter experience with a monster call. So I've had both. I've had really quick, really, you know, took a while, but, uh, um, it just feels like I can finally, finally give it to the fans of the book who have been very patient and they've asked me questions about it for years and to let them finally be able to see it is, uh, that's a bit of a relief. That's always good. Now I want to take things back actually to the knife of let, never letting go for a moment because I always thought the concept of the noise was very, very interesting. How'd you actually come up with that idea? Because it's not just as simple as, oh, well, you can hear men's thoughts, which I really, really thought was, was really cool. And, and, how, and also talk about the effect that that would have on the men in your story. Well, when I was writing it in sort of 2007, 2008, um, I, what I've you know, been calling it is like, that's kind of when we were in our first real big social media golden age, you know? We were really entrenched in it, we, Facebook, and. Twitter was starting and, you know, it's all, uh, we, we were feeling really, really good about it. You know, we thought this is a way to connect. I can talk to my family. I can talk to my friends. I can meet my tribe around the world, all good stuff. But even then I thought, um, that's all good, but it does feel a little loud. You know, the world mm -hmm. feels like it's gotten a bit louder where you are hearing someone's opinion, whether you want to hear it or not. And I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. So what if this kept growing? And what if the next step was that you had no choice? but to share everything and how awful that would be, particularly how awful that would be if you were young mm -hmm. and you needed the privacy to make your mistakes, to think the unthinkable so you don't say the unsayable. You know, we are, we are humans because we filter our thoughts. And uh, I thought, okay, that's, that's interesting. So I, I called it the noise just because the world felt loud to me. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then I, you know, made this town where this germ, germ had affected people. That's what they're told at the beginning. I'm not giving anything away. Um, and, uh, and I, then I thought, okay, the thing that I've long believed is, uh, that humans are not great at handling difference, just mere difference, handling it as different, but equal, because mm -hmm. we tend to either cast it as worse than us so we can step on it or better than us. So we need to tear it down. You know, just equal is not something we do very well. And so I thought, okay, so what if this difference say between men and women was made apparent in every, every single interaction in a way that you could not ignore, how would people reckon with it? And uh, I thought, that feels really meaty. That feels like a real story there because there'd be people who would handle it well, but there would be people who would handle it in the worst way possible. Um, so that's where, the, that's where the ideas began. And I kind of think in the 10 or 12 years since I wrote it, the world has only gotten noisier. Oh, our, no doubt. Our, yeah, our uh, kind of unalloyed love of social media has become a little more measured um it's you know still great i'm not i'm not trying to argue let's go back to the old mm -hmm. days where we write letters of pen and ink i'm just saying let's ask the questions that are important uh, always and we've seen how people can have learned to take social media and use it for malicious ends and nefarious ends and the spreads of spread of misinformation and the destruction of people and so on um and uh so I, and also um i don't pretend to be a prophet here but in the last 10 years we have seen pretty clearly um how much we don't listen to women uh, yeah. when they talk about their experiences. And so that's actually, you know, that, I'm not pretending to be some, you know, um, like I said, some, some prophet here about that, but uh, uh, that just happened to come true. So it feels kind of more pertinent than ever, kind of accidentally. I'm not pretending to be a psychic, but just um, it's the stuff that worried me then. It still worries me now. Yeah, you're, 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 not, you're not wrong about that, Patrick. Yeah. There's no doubt about that for sure. I, I want to take it back to the film for a second because you actually aged Todd up a little bit in this story. So in your opinion, what do you feel like drew fans to Todd's character for so many years in your story? And what do you feel Tom Holland actually brought to the role? Well, to me, the, the very greatest or the very best, the greatest is a, where a cheap word that people throw around so much, but the very best YA and the very best, best sci-fi, I feel do the same thing. They invite you in. They ask, who would you be in this story? You know, it's not just sit there passively. It's asking, how would you participate in this 
uh, fanciful idea or, you know, or, or in your youth. And so I hope that that's why people like Todd. I wanted to make him as relatable as possible. He's really, really flawed. And I wanted to make Viola the same way because so often girls in UI stories only get to be heroic and fierce and that's great and that's powerful. It's not fully human. And uh, so I wanted her to be heroic and fierce, but also screw up and also make mistakes. And uh, so that is what I hope people um, respond to, to the characters in the books. And that I think is what people respond to in Tom and Daisy. They're kind of superstardom is an approachable superstardom. You can see yourself being Peter Parker's friend. That's the whole point of Peter Parker. And you can see yourself being Ray's friend. You know, she's, a, she's an approachable person. You think I could, I could know her. And uh, that combination with um, Todd and Viola's characters, really, I'm fine with that, happy, that's perfect. It's exactly what I wanted. I didn't mind the aging up in any way because the question of the book is an arbitrary age that makes you a man is meaningless. Mm -hmm. you right. know? And her purpose or point is to say, you may not even be that age. The, the suns on this planet are different. You know, you, you might even be older. So you get to decide what makes you a man. A number does not. So uh, so I'm, I'm very, very happy with that. One of the things that actually strikes me about Viola, especially here in the in the film adaptation, is is it seems like there's a lot of people that are doing a lot for her at a, at a very big cost. Too. What is it about her instantly meeting her in these moments that, that, that just seems to make everybody around her want to help her so much? Is it an altruism type thing like you should help your your fellow your fellow humans or do you feel like it's something else for todd it's about who he is uh you know he's very much in this brutal brutal town um that has made everybody numb and in the book you know there's a there's a line where the mayor says you know you can still feel in this world where everyone has numbed themselves you can still feel and violet finally gives him a conduit for that he's she is not just the first woman he's ever seen she is uh, the revelation of the lie that he's been told. And so I think it's, it's speaks mostly to Todd, to Todd's character of he has the chance to be decent and not all of us would take it, but he does. And, uh, so that I think is where the hope for this world comes from because, you know, Todd and Viola might be the first people to work out this real problem that this planet has. So I think it's, I think it's, I'm try, just trying to speak to the character of Todd and hopefully you, we can see ourselves in him. If that makes sense. No, no doubt. No doubt about it. I totally agree with that. Now, whether you're talking about the novel or the film, quite frankly, I can't decide who I dislike more, Aaron or the mayor. I think that, well, I, I lean one way because of something very specific that happens in both stories that I will not tell you. I, I, I want to warn you, but I can't. So um, uh, how did you go about balancing the many threats in your story, whether it be from the from the book or from the movie itself? Well, uh, they are slightly different kinds of monsters. Um, Aaron is to me the danger of certainty. You know, it's not that he's religious, it's that he is unquestioning. And that is the terrifying thing. You cannot reason with him. And uh, that's why clowns are so scary, because their faces don't change. You Gosh, know, I never thought about it that way. I was never scared of clowns, now I'm going to be. <laughs> yeah, I'm terrified of clowns. But their faces don't change. You cannot reason with a the clown. There's no mercy there. And so that to me is kind of the, the he's, you know, he's, a, he's a, a raging fireball. The mayor is a different kind of, uh, of evil, I think. You know, I tried to make him, he doesn't believe he's evil. And that is, um, that to me is interesting. You know, he just has very firm opinions uh, about how the world should be and his place in it. Um, and uh, he is almost attractive in that in that he has a different kind of certainty you know in that belief in himself and uh, calm rarely loses his temper seems reasonable um and that is a that's a scary thing in a, in a leader um yeah the smiling tyrant is terrifying so i just tried to give them different different flavors because we, we know both of these people in real life and in you know in leadership roles so um uh yeah just different flavors watch out for certainty it's the thing that will thing that'll kill you in the end no doubt about that. Talking to Patrick Ness, who, of course, is the author of The Knife of Never Letting Go and, of course, one of the screenwriters on, on Chaos Walking because he would absolutely be, which is coming to video on demand, by the way. You can rent it starting April 2nd, and it's still in theaters as well. Now, Patrick, again, I don't want to spoil really spoil anything here, but in, in so many sci-fi stories, the monsters often take center stage. But, what, but with the spackle, it was a little bit different 
in your story because I don't I don't feel like you really made it about them when you easily could have. What made what made you decide to do that? The they started with the question about for just almost accidentally. Uh, I have read a lot of Australian literature. And uh, it just started because I liked an Australian author called Peter Carey. Then I ended up being asked to review a lot of Australian literature. And a lot of Australian literature is colonial literature. It's about, you know, and the founding of Australia and then the whole civilization of Australia that was before the so-called founding of Australia. And as an American too, particularly as an American in the West, I grew up in Hawaii and in Washington state um, where Hawaii has is one third native Hawaiian. And uh, my homestead of Washington has big reservations and, and Indian tribes, all the towns are named after Native American tribes. Um, and I just thought, okay, if we colonized another planet, would we make the same mistakes? Would we do the same things over and over again? And I'm afraid we probably would. And so it was trying to really take the idea of what is the alien? And uh, Violet even says, uh, you know, she says, well, but we're the aliens here. We're the aliens, it's their planet, you know? And, uh, and I just, wanted to ask that question from the point of view of the colonialist, you know, we have really, he's our hero, quote unquote, and he's the guy that we think is good and think is um, uh, gonna save us and save this planet, but um, he doesn't treat the natives particularly well. And, uh, and so uh, that question is a thorny one that infects Australian and American history. So I really just wanted it to be there. And in later books, the spackle do come much more centrally to the book but you know we start in this place after after the war has been terrible and the invaders have really scattered the native population nearby and so i, I wanted to slowly bring in the idea of um you think you think this is your home but it was somebody else's home first and you had to take it from them so what what, what does that mean for you and who, who does that mean for who you are it's just an interesting question to me for countries that have been based on colonization um, and America and Australia just being the two the two biggest ones you know so definitely that's that's some amazing insight I never I never would have known that that's really really cool I and you, you know you say stuff like that and and you've got something that this is your baby essentially right so then you take it from the page to the screen and you have to work with other people to essentially rewrite your baby in a certain sense so what was it like working with this team with this team of screenwriters and and the director that you had for this in putting this together, was there anything during the process where you go, okay, from the book, we, we have to stay absolutely true to this. There's no, this is a deal breaker for me. Well, I mean, my first, the first sort of principle that I try to work on is that the book remains, you know, I'm not, I'm not a rewriting the baby. I'm making a new baby. You right. Know what I mean? right. And, uh, and I, I, the word that I've always used is remix. I am remixing the book, you know, and the book stays and this is a remix of the book. And uh, the other principle is, uh, I think it was John Le Carre, who said, um, who said, just take the check and buy a new kitchen and let it go. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, that, you know, he's not wrong. Um, but, you know, since I'm a screenwriter on it as well, and as a screenwriter on, I wrote, I wrote a Monster Calls as a movie as well. Um, it, uh, I view it as essentially a movie is not a novel. It's a short story at most. And so... What a creative challenge to retell what you've done in a different form, in a completely different format in a much more limited time frame. And I think if you look at it as a creative challenge, well, that's where creativity comes from. Limitations spur creativity. And so I really try to look at it at that. And uh, as you say, movies are collaborative, which books are just not. And uh, those both come with their pluses and their minuses. But like I remember on a Monster Calls, um, you know, I'd already written the book, The Monster Calls, and it was based on the idea of another author who passed away. And then we brought in a, an illustrator. And so already that book felt like three people. And when the movie came, I felt like, okay, I'm bringing the best that I've got. I'm bringing the things that I really believe in. And then here's a director who's going to bring stuff that I don't know how to do. And he's going to bring his best stuff. Mm -hmm. And hopefully together we can make something even bigger than, than either of us. And uh, like in a monster calls those these animated sequences. I'm not an animator, and uh, but wow, what they did! Mm -hmm. So that's that's really how I tried to approach it with this. I did have a few things. Um, there are only a very few things in my contract, my option contract, which were that you can't change. <laughs> um, and one was actually changed. One was the book has two moons, and he said, "Well, can it be two suns?" I'm like, "Yeah, all right." 
Uh, okay, so that's uh, not too bad, I guess. That's not too bad because mm -hmm. these weren't, and these weren't. I didn't want any of those things to be stumbling blocks. I right. really just wanted those to be things that, if a filmmaker said, "Oh, yeah, I'm not going to change those," then you know you're talking to someone who I feel like gets it. Um, so one of them was the fate of a certain character, which I will not give away, but it's what you alluded to earlier, because I thought that would be the first thing Hollywood changed. Um, but uh, um, mostly it was just to try to see, try to get somebody who would really feel like they, they, they understood the spirit of the book. And once that's done, then you just let, it, let people bring their A game. The book is not disappearing. It's like, I've, I've used this example a lot because I really believe it's true. All that complaining about the Melissa McCarthy Ghostbusters, all that endless complaining about, oh, we're just gonna tar the memory and tarnish and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, if a movie is gonna erase another movie, did you not see Ghostbusters too? <laughs> you know, Ghostbusters is still fine. We can also have this other thing. Yep. It's fine. So I, I'm really, I'm pretty sanguine about that. It's, uh, yeah, I'm okay. Patrick, really quickly before I let you go, obviously fans know this is a trilogy. There's more story to tell from the books and things like that. So what are your hopes for continuing this story either on the screen or possibly, you know, on the page and on some other format? Ooh, page, probably not. Probably not. I like trilogies that end. I don't like trilogies that just sort of suddenly become... Okay, quality. had to get that out of the way. Okay. Yeah, yeah that terrible thing. Um, but, I, you know, I'm always open to further storytelling. There's so many ways to tell stories now, um, you know, and, and uh, it is it is the golden age of television, for example. I mean, it is amazing what you can do on television now. And, um, and uh, yeah, I am always open. Never say never, because then you're just cutting yourself off to opportunity. I'm not saying I wouldn't want to see more live action, but I, but I'm thinking like if if this was an anime, that could be <laughs> that could look crazy good, especially with with what they're doing with with anime now. I'm that that to me could look really cool. So I'm I'm just saying. I know I same here. I think it could look really cool on the stage. Oh I yeah, could, yeah. There's all kinds of things you could do. So I'm I'm always open. I'm always I want to learn stuff and I want to learn new ways of telling stories. So I am always open. Come well, talk to me, creators. <laughs> there you go. Well, if you haven't yet, make sure you're starting with Chaos Walking, which is still in theaters now. Should theaters be open where you are, uh, you can go ahead and watch it there. Also, on video on demand, it's going to start becoming available to rent on April the, April the 2nd. Won't be too long after that until you can own it, and then you can just watch it as many times as you like. It's author extraordinaire Patrick Ness of Chaos Walking from Lionsgate Pictures. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.